just so you'll know, my phone is turned off. Yeah, I know. We were all surprised last week, weren't we? <laughs> so anyways, it's turned, I did that a little while ago. This morning's lesson is called Released. And I did this, thought about this lesson like the day after my, you know, Jerry passed away, is how can we, how can we face death with, okay, how does, a, how does a faithful child of God face death? Let me put it that way. How, we, how do we do that? Uh, this may not be the perfect lesson for that, but it's the one that I came up with, and, and so there you have it. Second Timothy chapter 4. Paul says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctr doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith, and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto, unto godliness. For the bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Um, okay, that's 1 Timothy chapter 5. How about we go to 2 Timothy chapter 4? Man, I didn't think that sounded right, but it's what I had marked. Okay. I should have left my phone on, I guess. I don't know. Okay. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge thee before. Charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing at his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. But watch thou on all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now, he doesn't seem to be afraid. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He did what he was told to do. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to be only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Well, now, question. How do we know that Paul loved his appearing? I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. His departure was at hand, but he knew how he had lived, that he lived the life that God had directed him to live. He knew that he did that, and so he had no fear of death. Now, every time I preach on this topic, I always I make mention of that, but I also say, never having done it, I'm nervous about it. I'm always nervous about something I've never done before and can't talk to anybody that's ever done it. So, I understand somebody being a little bit drawing back from it, but here it is nonetheless. So, how is it the faithful Christian can face death without fear and even a sense of longing? A sense of longing. Paul again says, If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, let him be accursed, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. So here he's talking about not loving the Lord, but he wants the Lord to come quickly. Philippians 4, 5, Paul says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. In some form or fashion, the Lord was near. I think he was looking towards the, the destruction of Jerusalem in the not-too-distant future. In Revelation 14, 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. There's something about being in the Lord that allows us to be blessed or happy when we die at that point of death. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. That's a crucial point. What was Paul's discussion? I have kept the faith. I've finished the course. I have done those things God has instructed me to do. 
And I did it because I loved him. I, I developed the, the idea, the affection for him. So how is it that those that die in the Lord are blessed? Because of what they have done. Because of their lifestyle. Consider Paul's admonition to the, uh, to the Thessalonians. Over in Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Because the Thessalonian brethren were, were concerned about the coming of the Lord. They thought he was coming real, like just, he, he's, he's on his way. And Paul says, no, no, that's not the case. He, we don't know when he's coming. And don't worry about those of your number that have died. Well, the, they're dead, so what, what's going to happen to them if the Lord comes now? He says, don't worry about that, because the Lord's going to bring them with him. All right. Uh, concerning them which are asleep, that she sorrow not, even as others which have no hope, a confident expectation. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him those that sleep in Jesus. Blessed are they that die in the Lord. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, if it be now or next month or next year, or 2,500 years yet in the future. Um, the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, shall not go before them. In other words, we're going to wait. We will be here when the Lord gets here with those that have passed away. We're not going anywhere by ourselves. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, Again, those that, that are dead in the Lord. For the faithful child of God, what does physical do, death do for us? And this is something we all need to be aware of and, and have in mind. Now, <clears throat> this lesson is geared towards the faithful Christian. The unfaithful Christian and the non-Christian benefits from it by seeing what they're missing out on. Are you saying they're going to be lost? That's what the Bible teaches. And I'm just reiterating the point. But this person's life, this faithful Christian's life, is characterized by righteousness. Characterized by righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.7 But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, so my life is characteristic of being Christ-like. You've got to keep that in mind. Don't forget that. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So if my life is characterized as Christ-like in its totality, and we'll cover the exception here in just a moment, then the blood of Jesus continues to wash me clean, and I am in a state of, of sanctification. Ongoing process. Now what does that mean? Well, what does... Which, which does not mean, rather, that we do not sin, for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. But notice 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, beginning. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Now, John's writing to Christians, and apparently he's writing to those that are faithful Christians. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess that sin that is not characteristic of one that is walking in the light of Christ, who we're talking about, so the sin that the, child of God, the faithful child of God commits is not characteristic of him. It's a characteristic of his human side that he allows to, to overcome him upon occasion. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, child of God, faithful child of God, whose life is characterized as walking in Christ, as being Christ-like in its overall outlook, does commit the occasional sin because we are human, and that person recognizes that sin when it's committed, or shortly thereafter, confesses it to God, re repents of it, confesses it to God, and God forgives him of the sin, washes it away once again. What have I to fear? What have I to dread? Leaning on the everlasting arms. That's the child of God that seeks to do his will. God has promised to forgive. 1 John 1, 9. 
Now, well, I don't know if he can forgive me. Well, number one, you don't have enough faith in God, and you don't trust his word. Well, I know me. Well, I, I understand. I, I, I get that. I've lived in here about 70 years now, and I know my own shortcomings, and I'm trusting God to be a forgiving God and a big enough God to forgive me my silliness. Okay. And he does not lie, Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. So, what does that mean? He's promised to do something based upon certain conditions being met. He does not lie. So when those certain conditions are met, again, go back to 1 John chapter 1 in verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, what's the condition for forgiveness of sin for the child of God to confess the sin you've committed? And then God forgives you. Well, if that's the way God does it, then it has to work that way for me. This is a free on the lesson. I don't care how willing you are to forgive a person that's transgressed against you. You cannot forgive them, biblically speaking, until that person has repented. And brought forth fruits meet for repentance. Because that's how God forgives. Unless you're bigger than God. And I'll let you decide that. I've had that argument before. I just brought that up. That's free. <laughs> All right. How can I know. Notice I've got it in big caps there. How can I know. I live characteristically righteous. Now listen. We all know ourselves. We know where our weaknesses are. We know when we stumble. We know why we stumble. We know the re we, we understand. We know that. How can God forgive me? Well, Saul of Tarsus murdered the church. Okay. So where do you stack up on in that thing? Where are you on that frame? Have you murdered the church? Probably in there, probably way down here. If you say no, then you're way down here. Okay. So if God can forgive that, surely he can forgive you for whatever it is you've done. And uh, anyways, first Peter, first, second, second Peter chapter one, uh, looking at the first three verses, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our savior, Jesus Christ. Notice that obtained like precious faith through the righteousness of God, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge, through the knowledge of God. Mark that through the knowledge of God. And of Jesus Christ, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Here it is again. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us, and we're called by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13 and 14, to glory and virtue. Through the knowledge. If you don't get that, you're going to miss the rest of this. Now, whereby are given us exceeding great and through the knowledge are given unto us great exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust well how does the knowledge help me it tells you what to do how did paul know what to do god told him what to do and he did what he was told to do he said that's what he said that's what he said in the text that i read a few minutes ago i've kept i've kept the faith i've done what i was told to do I did my duty. I did my obligation. I was an unprofitable servant, Luke 17, 10, but I did my duty. Now, verses 5, 6, and 7 gives us some boxes to check off, some, some, some targets to shoot at, some things to know the knowledge and to do, that if I'm doing these things, I'm on that pathway. How do I know if I've never been to Greenville, Mississippi before? Lived in Indianola all of my life. Never been to Greenville, Mississippi. Never talked to anybody that's been to Greenville, Mississippi before in my life. How am I going to know to get there? I may not know about it in the first place, but so, somebody mentions Greenville, Mississippi in passing. I'd like to go there. How am I going to get there? You're going to ask somebody. And he's going to, he or she's going to tell you, get out here, walk out the front door, turn right, and go straight. That's what Gary Freed told me years ago. I wanted to go to the Greenville Mall. He said, Get out there and turn right and go straight till you get to Route 1 and turn left and go south and it'll be a while down your left. Oh, I did. It's just where he said it was. Through the knowledge that Gary had given me, I got to the Greenville Mall. Go figure. So when God tells us what to do, 
gives us the knowledge, and we do what he tells us to do to get what he to receive what he wants to give us, we can have it. And we can know that we have. I knew I was at the Greenville Mall. Sign said Greenville Mall. I knew I was there. I can know that I'm saved because I've done what the Bible tells me to do. And God has promised to keep his, has, and God's not a liar and keeps his promise. And I'll drop down to verse 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You do something. What do I do? Go back up to verses 5, 6, and 7 and read that again to yourself. Don't do it now, but when you get home, go back to verses 5, 6, and 7, 2 Peter 1, and read those things. Study those things, find out what they mean, and then ask yourself, does this describe me to any extent? Well, that's yes or no, or I'm not real sure. Call me, we'll help you. I'm helpful that way. All right. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance, by doing these things, shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's a promise. That's a statement of fact. It's in granite. You can take it to the bank and all those other things we say to affirm something to be positive. So if I do these things, if I give diligence to make my calling and election sure, I'll never fall given that condition. Not once saved, always saved. The perseverance of the saints, false doctrine. Because I can stop doing those things and lose my, lose my faith. I can fall from grace. Okay. John 14, 15. Jesus says, if you let me keep my commandments. Galatians 5 and verse 6, uh, uh, grace that worketh, uh, faith that worketh by love. Circumcision or uncircumcision availeth nothing. But faith that worketh, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, but faith that worketh by love. Not just checking the boxes. I gave the example a while back when we were down in Auburndale, Florida years ago, had a lady that had a balance problem. She had a, 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 a golden retriever that was her uh, service dog. And when she started getting wobbly, the dog would press up against her. Can I bring my dog to church? Sure. Well, somebody complained. She said, he'll be underneath the pew. I said, that's all right. You bring him to church. Somebody complained, send him to me. I'll talk to him. Now, I'll tell you this. I told you that to tell you this. That dog was more faithful than some of the brethren were. That's a shame. I mean, we laugh about it. It's funny, but it's a shame. That dog was there for as long as that lady attended. She attended for a while. That dog was more faithful than some of the brethren were. I don't know. Just, it's just one of those things. Ephesians 2, uh, grace you're saved by faith, not, not of yourselves. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in, uh, in Christ Jesus unto good works that God hath before ordained that we should walk therein. Well, what are those works? Well, just going back to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. How about we start there again? Go back and look at those, and, and that's at least some of the things. John 6, 28 and 29, speak, Jesus speaking to the disciples, they said, what must we do to work the works of God? Well, Jesus said, shrugged his shoulders, I don't have a clue. No, he didn't. He said, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. Belief is a work. It's one of those things we are to give diligence to make our calling and election sure. If we have expectation of entering into the kingdom of heaven, if we want to die blessed in the Lord, we will, we will have that understanding of who Jesus Christ is and what it means to us. And yes, it's a work. So ever since I've trusted Jesus Christ, my personal Savior, those people believe in working the way to heaven. Not in the way they mean, though. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, he says, And hereby we do know that we know him. If, condition statement, we keep his commandments. Oh, how I love Jesus. Can't get you to show up to worship assemblies. Oh, how I love Jesus. But you're running around like everybody else out there in the world. Dressed like everybody else. Speaking like everybody else. Going to the same filthy movies that everybody else is going to. How are you different than anybody else? Well, you're not. Oh, I, I love Jesus. No, you don't. How can you say that? Well, I just see what you do. That flows from your heart. Jesus said, John chapter 12, verse 34, 35. What you do, what you say, flows from your heart. So what you do is in your heart. 
That's that, yeah, that's a judgment. It's a righteous judgment. John 7, verse 24. Judge righteous judgment. Goes on, he goes on, he says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Is your life characteristic of being Christ-like in its outlook, in its, in its everyday existence? If it's not, here's what you do. You repent, confess it to God, and get back on the straight and narrow. Well, I don't know if I can do that. Well, let's join the, join the club. You're not by yourself. That's, that's why we get here on Sunday morning. To worship God, recharge ourselves, get back on the process in the, in the life. Hebrews 5 and verse 9, He is the author of eternal salvation unto all those that obey Him. Now you believe in your work and way to heaven. Oh, I believe in doing what the, the, God, I believe in doing the works that God has ordained that we should walk therein. But I'm humble enough to know that when I've done all those things that are commanded me, say I'm an unprofitable servant, I've done that which was my duty to do, Luke 17 and verse 10. Go back and read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul said, I have kept the faith. Are you keeping the faith? Be careful. Be careful. You can say you're keeping it, and you're not. Well, how do I know I'm keeping it? Well, go back and listen to the tape again. <laughs> we don't have time to go back. Secondly, we are released from this trial this sphere of trial. Man, look at all the problems you have. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, for our light affliction. Here's the Apostle Paul, been whipped twice with, with uh, 40 stripes save one. He's been stoned to death. He's been shipwrecked. He's starved half to death. Uh, he had all kinds of problems. The brothers, brethren hated him. The Jews hated him. The Romans hated him. Okay. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Remember John Ed Cawthon, James, James Bradshaw, and I would go visit him. 93 years old. Uh, what does it feel like? He said, I don't know where it's all gone, preacher. 93-year-old 93, 93 man. I don't know where it's all gone. Whew. Boy, isn't that the case. I understand that. Which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen... This stuff out here. But at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In other words, regardless of the burden you carry in this life, when your spirit departs your body, when you've drawn your last breath and exhaled it, and the angels are there to carry you to the, bur to the bosom of Abraham and get you there into paradise, you're going to stand there and say, what was all the excitement about? Looky here. No more doctor's appointments and canes and achy legs and stuff you can't get out and all the other problems we've got. And we're no longer troubled by fleshly desires. Ephesians 2. When in time, we're in a time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature, by definition, that means course of action. Here it is right here. Here's, 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 here's by nature, right there. All of you that wear glasses understand that. One of these days you take those glasses off and you go like that and you go like that because your glasses aren't there to push up on your nose, okay? That's what he's talking about. By, by habit, by just the way you behave on a normal basis, until you learn better, of course. By nature, the children of wrath, even as others. Luke chapter, or 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world. Oh, listen, I, I like living here. I mean, I, I like my life. I've, I've got a good life. I have no complaints. I've, a couple rough spots. I've had it good. But this isn't all. By any shake of the imagination. We're in time, um, and love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That goes back to what Paul said in Ephesians 2. 
lusts of the flesh, our flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind. He's not the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. One of these days, all this is going to be gone. E either you're going to be gone from it, or it's all going to disappear anyways. Think of Matthew chapter 25 and 46. The unrighteous is going to go into eternal damnation, and the righteous into life eternal. It's going to be an amazing process. Our biggest challenge to faithfulness is ourselves. We are our biggest challenge. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 says, but I keep under my body. One translation says, I buffet my body daily. And bring it into subjection. I have to whip myself to bring me into subjection. Sounds like your dad, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Gary's nodding his head. Yeah. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Why would he say that if he can't be a castaway? 1 John 5, he says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Our faith, the faith of God, the knowledge that we get through the Father, tells us how we're to behave and what it is we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do those things. How do I know how to worship God? That's one of the things Paul said to the Athenians. Listen, you've got this, this uh, um, uh, altar, I want to say ark, altar over here to the unknown God. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about the unknown God. All right? He told him about the unknown God. That's how they knew about Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. And Satan can no longer get at us. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. He like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. We are released from illness and disease. Today, just as in previous times, some diseases could only be cured through miracles. You know, a man born blind, John chapter 9. I mean, you're born blind, there's just, you're, if you ever receive your eyesight, it'll be a miracle. Miracles don't happen today, not like Bible times. I'm, I'm not talking about extraordinary circumstances. I'm talking about somebody being raised from the dead. I'm talking about leprosy being healed. Uh, I'm talking about all those issues, you know, the devil's being cast. That's the miraculous Bible times. I'm not talking about uh, extraordinary circumstances, you know, you know, but for the grace of God, I could have died. I fell asleep on a motorcycle at 3.30 in the morning, 70 miles an hour, Interstate 64. Don't do that. How, can you, how are you alive? <laughs> Extraordinary circumstances. I'll just tell you, I don't know, but here I am. Anyways, today just in previous time. Okay, such issues are traced to the garden and loss of access to the tree of life. Why do we get sick? Why do we get old? We go back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. We lost access to the tree of life. Now, Revelation chapter 22, uh, by the way, we get it back. Revelation chapter 22, 1 through 5, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, <coughs> which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face and his name, and shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Getting the tree, the getting leaves from the tree of life will be a spectacular thing. Healing of the nations. All mankind is subject to death. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. It's appointed man unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Ecclesiastes 2 says, For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which is now, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall be all shall all be forgotten. And how do, dieth the wise man as the fool? I don't care who you are. If you live long enough, you're going to die. Whether I, don't, I don't care whether you're the president. I don't care whether you're king of the earth. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the bugger, beggar out there in the corner. You're going to die. And you're going to be buried. Or cremated, whatever. Ecclesiastes 3. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath, one life force. So that a man hath no preeminence above a beast for all his vanity. We all have a life force. It's very similar. That's not the same thing as the spirit of man and that which makes us mankind. But rather that breath of life that gets us, gets us going. Fourthly, we are released 
to a much better existence as, faith, as a faithful Christian. Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31, the account of the rich man and Lazarus. Some folks see that's a parable. I, I say it's an account of action, but if you disagree, that's okay. It's not, that, it's not worth the fight. Having traveled the straight and narrow way, way while here, Matthew 7, 13 to 14, the straight gate, straight way, so forth, Revelation 20, verse 13, we will be met and carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, Luke 16 and 22. I don't know how that works. Honestly, don't. The Bible doesn't describe it. just talks about it. just says, here's the fact of it. When you die physically and your spirit departs your body, the angels are going to be there waiting on you as a faithful child of God to bear your spirit to the bosom of Abraham like, like Lazarus was. Now, I don't know how electricity works. I'm just glad that it does. I don't know how all this works. I'm just glad that it will. So that when I, as a faithful, when I die as a faithful Christian, blessed in the Lord, the angels are going to be there to bear my spirit to the bosom of Abraham. They can carry me by hand. They can put me in a cart. They can, I, don't, I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> as long as I'm there, we're good. We're like gold. At the final judgment, we will receive vindication and rest. All of the bad things that have happened to you in your life that you have endured reasonably without complaining too loud will be vindicated. All the bad things that anybody's ever done to you, all the mean stuff, all the evil stuff, all the abuse you've taken over the years, God's going to sort it out. And it'll be a right sorting out. And you will be vindicated. And everybody will recognize. They won't like it probably, but they will understand it. For the righteous child of God, there is no downside to physical death. Listen, my wife's, I, I was telling Gary a little while ago, I looked, downloaded all the photos off my wife's phone, put it in a file on my computer, and the photos that she had on her phone at the time went back to like September this past fall, and I could see her fading away. I, I, you know, I, when you're in the middle of the forest, you don't see trees. <laughs> you're in the middle of the forest. I didn't realize, I didn't realize how much of a change it was until I saw when she was okay until literally the moments of her death. Um, I, I, was, I was absolutely stunned, but, you know, you, you see those things and you see the changes and you realize that she's better off. I mean, I don't, I, I, I miss her, but I don't mourn her. I'm glad she's dead because she suffered greatly. And I'm glad for her. Sad for me, but glad for her. So, you know, I, I don't know how people that don't have a biblical faith. I don't know how they do it. I, I have no clue. I, I, I know how I would have been if I, st if I was still a, my misspent and ill-begotten youth, still, still that way, and went, had to go through this. I know how I'd be today. I still probably wouldn't be sober because that's how I was back then. I wasn't a child of God. I had no faith to stand on. We faithful children of God, have a foundation upon which to stand. And that's the word of God. Now, this is not a lesson to try to prove God exists and the Bible is his word. That's, that's been done before. But we are liable to judge ourselves too harshly and may doubt God's grace. 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God and put to, de put to death in the flesh, uh, and be, being put to death. I got the wrong passage again. It's 2 Peter chapter 3. I apologize for that. 2 Peter chapter 3. I wish I could blame it on my <sighs> word correction. 3, 18 through 20. I apologize. 1 Peter chapter. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Just give me a minute. Let me speak. Right. No. How about. Well. How about first Peter? Where am I? I missed. I've just totally missed it. Just the soul's figure into it. Ah. There's Second Peter. There's Second Peter chapter two. It was in my Bible at one time. Chapter three. <laughs> nope. Well. I apologize for that, but it's the passage in first. 
Well, now I'm starting to sweat. 118. First Peter 118. I don't think that's even it, but I'll look at it and see what it is. No. But it's the it's the passage where he says that he knows our heart and our heart is bare. Our heart condemns us, but our heart condemns us, but he knows our heart and he understands how we are. I'm, I apologize for that. Man, I apologize for that. But if we are truly in Christ, then upon our death, we are going to be richly blessed. Revelation 14, 13. Uh, blessed are they that die in the Lord. And that's the point of all of this. The thing is, is we need to take the Lord at his word and simply do what he says to do. And he's promised to uphold his end of the bargain. The, the, the covenant is, is that if we follow him faithfully and do what he says to do for the reasons he says to do it, in the end, we're going to be eternally blessed. So if you're not a child of God, become one. If you are a, if you are a child of God, you've been unfaithful, we beg you to come back. Ask his forgiveness. He's promised to forgive you. If you have questions, let's sit down and talk about it. That's, that's what we're here for. And, and you won't make me angry and so forth. We'll sit and talk about it until you, you're satisfied. But if you do need to respond to the invitation of Christ, we certainly invite you to come while together we stand and sing the hymn of invitation.